there are few psychology studies as famous, or perhaps I should say as infamous, as Zimbardo's prison experiment. Investigating the causes of prison violence in the basement of Stanford University, he took on the role of prison intendant, randomly assigning half a group of college-aged males to be prison inmates, while the other half became prison officers. The result? Absolute chaos. No surprise, right? But Zimbardo argued this was evidence of previously independent individuals adapting their behaviour to fit into the defined social roles of the prison environment. The prison officers becoming dominant and aggressive, and the prisoners, well at first attempting to resist, ultimately becoming submissive. Zimbardo claimed that even he was taken over by his need to perform the role of prison superintendent, prioritising the need to run his prison over the well-being of his participants. You can now follow along by making your notes in my PsychBoost workbook, 150 full-colour worksheets covering all the compulsory units. It's on Amazon, or you can get signed editions from my website. And teachers can order packs for the whole class. Conformity to social roles. As this video is fundamentally about conformity to social roles, we should define a social role. A commonly accepted definition is a socially defined pattern of behaviour that's expected of persons who occupy a certain social position or belong to a particular social category. It might be helpful to pause a moment here and consider some social positions and what are expected socially defined patterns of behaviour for people in those roles. Someone can have the social role of doctor, teacher, police officer, politician, student, artist, prisoner or correctional officer. What stereotypical behaviours would you expect of people in these roles? Well, you would likely expect the doctor to be empathetic and caring, the teacher to be knowledgeable and communicative, the police officer to be confident and act with authority, the politician to be, well, let's say, persuasive and charismatic. Ideally, the student should be curious and hardworking, an artist unconventional and passionate, a prisoner submissive or potentially dangerous, and finally would expect a correctional officer to be tough, uncaring and domineering. Of course, not all people in those roles act this way, but they are the stereotypical mental images we have when considering those roles. In the previous video, we discussed three types of conformity. The identification type of conformity is where membership of a group is valued, and even if we don't privately agree with the beliefs and behaviours of the group, we adopt them publicly to feel part of the group. You can probably see how that type of conformity links to social roles people like to have a sense of social identity. And by conforming to the socially defined pattern of behaviours linked to a social role, we can define ourselves as members. Philip Zimbardo thought the reason for the intense levels of aggression in the American prison system was due not to dispositional reasons, so not due to bringing together naturally aggressive prisoners and prison officers. Instead, he claimed aggression was situational. The environment of the prison itself led to people acting according to expected social roles that promoted abuse. In order to study conformity to social roles in a prison setting, Zimbardo created a mock prison in the basement of Stanford University. His aim was to see if typical, mentally healthy people would conform to the social roles of guards, so become aggressive, and the social roles of prisoners, so submissive. Zimbardo's study is typically referred to as the Stanford Prison Experiment, and abbreviated to the SPE. Zimbardo's Prison Study You can see here the original advert asking for volunteers for a 7-14 to 14 day study on prison life for $15 a day. Applicants were given psychological testing to ensure mental stability, and ultimately 24 were selected. Importantly, the participants were randomly assigned to be prisoners or guards to reduce the likelihood of participant variables. The prisoners' experiences included being unexpectedly arrested at home by real police officers, being booked, deloused, and given a basic prison uniform with their assigned ID number on it. The prisoners had a list of rules to follow, but the prisoners also had rights, like free meals a day, supervised toilet trips, and visits from family. Each cell contained free prisoners. To give the guards an appearance of authority, they were given uniforms, a club, whistles and sunglasses. Their instruction was to manage the prison without resorting to violence. Unlike the prisoners, the guards returned home at the end of their eight-hour shift. In the study, Zimbardo played the part of chief prison superintendent and lead investigator, a point I'll return to in the evaluations. 
Zimbardo found that both prisoners and guards quickly lost their individual identities and took on the social roles of prisoner or guard. The prisoners initially attempted to resist. They barricaded themselves in their cells, using their bedding to block the cell doors. The guards quickly crushed the rebellion, and the prisoners became passive. As the experiment progressed, the prisoners showed significant distress, to the point that a number of the prisoners were released early after experiencing mental breakdowns. The guards became authoritative, and some of them became sadistically aggressive. Due to the extreme responses of the prisoners and guards, after six days, the study was ended early. Zimbardo claimed that his study demonstrates that the situational power of the prison environment can make otherwise mentally healthy individuals act out social roles that lead them to highly aggressive behaviours. Zimbardo's prison study, evaluations. Let's start with some positive evaluations. We can praise the SBE's methodology in terms of the initial setup. The participants were carefully selected, suggesting none of the participants were naturally highly aggressive, and the participants were randomly assigned to be prisoners or guards. This high level of control reduced the likelihood of participant variables. We can also say that the findings of the Stanford Prison Experiment have been practically applied to understand real-life examples of institutional abuse. One famous example is the American military prison of Abu Ghraib. In this prison, an environment of few rules and little oversight, Iraqi detainees were tortured, sexually abused, and even killed by American army personnel. The world found out about this abuse due to the leaking of photographs of military personnel posing for selfies next to their victims. After careful consideration, I've decided not to show those pictures uncensored. However, I do think they are historically important. And if you'd like to see them, they're on the Wikipedia page I've linked in the video description and the comments. Zimbardo even appeared as an expert witness at the subsequent trial. The findings of the Stanford Prison Experiment are taught in military and law enforcement settings in an attempt to reduce the likelihood of further abuses. Now I'm going to move into criticisms. Firstly, due to ethical concerns, replications are rare. Rachel and Haslam carried out one of the few attempts at a replication for a BBC documentary with more safeguards. I've linked to a video by The Open University that uses original footage of the documentary and includes interviews with the researchers. I recommend you watch that video after this. But to summarise their findings, the participants did not conform to social roles, they acted more in line with their personalities, and the guards willingly gave up their powerful positions. In fact, in the Stanford Prison Experiment, only one third of the guards actually showed sadistic aggression. The other guards were generally passive. These results suggest that social roles have a limited influence on behaviour. So you might be wondering, what caused the extreme aggression that was observed in the Stanford Prison Experiment? Well, a serious criticism of Zimbardo's work is he took on the dual role of prison superintendent and lead investigator, which likely led to experimenter bias. The presence of Zimbardo likely influenced the behaviour of the participants. The prison superintendent interacting with the participants really should have been someone who didn't know the aims of the experiment. The participants likely worked out the aims of the study and acted according to demand characteristics, acting in a way they thought Zimbardo wanted them to behave. And it actually gets worse than this. Recent analysis of the records of the Stanford Prison Experiment have found that Zimbardo and the other researchers directly instructed the guards to be highly aggressive, meaning the conclusion that the guards were aggressive due to adapting to social roles is likely invalid. Our final evaluation is likely the one that you most expected. The participants, especially the prisoners, really suffered harm as a consequence of taking part in this experiment. While the study was called to a stop after six days, it was continued far beyond the point that the participants showed significant distress, and many of the prisoners felt they had no right to withdraw. If nothing else, Zimbardo's work demonstrates the importance of ensuring studies are conducted with ethical safeguards in place. I want to thank everyone over on Patreon for supporting the channel. Because of you, I've been able to teach part-time, meaning I can make Psych Boost on YouTube for everyone. And a special thank you to Azzy Taylor for supporting at the developer level. I do have extra resources that are exclusive to my patrons, so if you do decide to sign up, you can grab those over my website. These include over 100 exam question tutorial videos, of course, including questions on the social influence unit. I hope this was helpful and I will see you in the next Psych Boost video.